I've been an electronic dance music producer, performer, and primarily an improviser for the last 30 years. I was fortunate that when I started making electronic dance music, that it came at a time when electronic dance music was actually evolving in the late 80s and early 90s. The studio's instrument is an important part of understanding how I make. So how do I make? It starts with this massive thing called a studio instrument. And it's fair to say, I don't use every single part connected all together and I hit play or on my DAW. No, it doesn't work like that for me. I literally start with a drum machine, a synthesizer, a mixer and some effects, and maybe one or two devices and I pair it and it starts to build from there. So it's almost like I construct this layer of beats and rhythms and then I deconstruct it. So I'm not plugging everything in at the same time, just that every device gives me another option or another, I guess, another uh, layer of sounds or another function that can help. Every performance and every composition that I do is a moment in time. I, I do not save anything. I'm not interested in saving because I'm not interested in going back into the past or replicating that for the future. So many of the things that I use, I will not save and I'll actually program in the moment. Now it's fair to say some of the components that I use can't, cannot be programmed in the moment, and I have to program those sequences prior to performing or composing. In this video, I'll go through how I program the 909 drum machine, the Roland TB303, and the Moog DFAM, and how I put them all together. First, I'll create the uh, 303 pattern, clear the pattern, add the pitches in. I did say pitches. Uh, my timing, yes, this is all pretty much random. And I'm adding in these slides and accents. So we'll listen to this. Oh, pattern's not cleared, is it? <laughs> oh. We can do better than that. Let's try this. to trigger the DFAM, I'm doing that via the rim shot on the 909. So I'll have to add a whole lot of rim shots in the 909, but I'll keep the volume down. <laughs> Thank you. 
write sequences on, say, vintage devices, I'm not using them in a prescribed way. So sequence one on a particular drum machine or a synth doesn't correlate to sequence one on another synth or another device whatsoever. I'll pretty much just choose a random sequence when I feel it's time to move on. Here's an excerpt from a live show I did back in 2020 for Mystery Land in the Netherlands. Here you can see the array of gear and how I change between the different patterns across all the different devices I have without any distinct specific correlation between the patterns themselves. What this requires me to do is to actually listen carefully to what I introduce. Again, construct and deconstruct.
most people will call me a DJ, but I'm not a DJ by any means. I'm actually performing this live in the moment, improvising in the moment. Every set is completely unique for a number of reasons. One, I may be using different gear. Two, I don't save. And I'm always changing the configuration of the gear or the permutation of the gear as well. Whereas a DJ primarily is playing back pre-recorded tracks or stems of pre-recorded tracks. So a DJ can replicate something that the audience may have heard before. For me, I can't do that. Not only can I not do that, I'm not interested in doing that. And therefore makes every performance rather unique. I always play in the middle of the dance floor with people around me so they can actually see that something physical is actually going on. This photo was taken earlier this year in 2021 and a small period of time in Melbourne, Australia, where we could interact with one another. But due to the pandemic and COVID, it's been really hard to play in front of people, pretty much. I haven't been able to for almost two years. So these days, I'm doing a lot of performances streaming live from my studio itself. When I perform from my studio, of course, I have the privilege of choice of all the different devices and modules within my studio, but naturally, not every single one of them is plugged in. Coming from a non-traditional background, I don't quite understand pitch or tone. For me, it's a density of sounds and rhythms and beats. And I'm kind of deconstructing and reconstructing all the time. And it's the happy accidents that inform the direction of the work itself. In this clip, I'm experimenting with textural qualities of sound by processing it over and over again through a sampler and through some Eurorack FX modules. Again, there is no deliberate approach here. It's just really a matter of just throwing everything through everything and seeing what comes out. In this recent performance, I adopted the same techniques as the previous clip by exploring the textural qualities of a few instruments. Here, I highlight the Buchla Music Easel and the Soma Pulsar 23. This is kind of dub techno, ambient, down tempo. And you can see here, in contrast to the previous clip, I take my time, tempo is slower. And you can start to hear the the finer nuances of the sound and texture.
And next up on on our awesome Soundwave Live um, is our man Honey Smack. Now he has released uh, his music on, on our our label, and uh, we have to say he's one of the most uh, imaginative, <laughs> prolific, and also his music is all on the fly. Really, he just gets into it, and he just goes and goes. So we're really looking forward to seeing Honey Smack right here on ASW Live. Some nice words there from Carl Cox. So a common question I often get asked is, how do I prepare for a, a live show, particularly one where I'm in front of an audience? Now mind you, Awesome Soundwave Live 3 was not in front of a live audience, but it was recorded at Carl Cox's garage. So how do I go from my studio to this? Here, I'm in my home studio just before the recording of Awesome Soundwave Live 3 and me playing with different permutations of the gear that I'm about to take to Awesome Soundwave. So what's important for me is that I set up my permutation of my studio instrument and I simply just play with it. I find out its limitations. I find out how things are working. But I'm certainly not saving any particular phrase or sequences or tracks. So it's just finding my way around my machine and understanding the ebb and flow of its different uh, connections. So here's a shot of the actual gear that I took to Carl Cox's place. It is pretty much similar to what I was doing in my home studio. Top left, working down, we've got the MC202, which is a mono synth. We've got the TR8 drum machine, which is where all the drums, the main drums are coming from. Beneath that is a 303. Moving along, we have the Octatrack. So the Octatrack is the master clock. So everything is synchronized to the Octatrack via MIDI and Below that is a Avalon baseline machine, which is another 303. In the middle of the setup, I have a little Mackie desk where all the audio is mixed and I mix on the fly and the mixer is also an important part of the studio instrument as well. Then I've got a chaos pad sitting in front of that for effects. Then we move to the semi-modular rig, which is the Moog Mother 32 and DFAMs, they're the black modular synths. Below that is another little boat containing some effects, modular effects. And then to the far right is the Tempest drum machine, which I use rather sparingly. Okay, so let's have a look at a longer excerpt of the Awesome Soundwave Live 3. And you can actually see how I perform in the moment and the decisions I make. And you'll also notice that I don't wear headphones, so I'm not cueing anything. It's important that I'm listening to what I'm doing all the time. Listening is the key.
quite a bit in the last 30 odd minutes. So I hope it's been of value to you. Hope you found this interesting and thanks for having me. As always, please feel free to follow me on my social media channels and I'll do my best to answer any questions you may have. Thanks again.